Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Adam Collard. I work for Canonical on the landscape team. Uh, today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our reference architecture for deploying OpenStack and uh, the autopilot, which is a feature of landscape for um, deploying that reference architecture on your hardware. OK, so what do we mean by architecture? Well, if we look back in recent years, um, it used to be that a, uh, a simple, all you needed to do for, to deploy software was know about a single piece of software. It had some configuration files, and it, it ran on one machine. But these days, with modern software like OpenStack or machine learning or big data things, we have a full set of different services and we, the key piece of information, the key thing that we need to know is how to put that onto two machines, four machines, or 100 machines. And that's what we mean by architecture. It's about laying down those services on your sets of machines, working out what goes where, what can be co-located with what. So the reference architecture that Canonical employs is built to scale from very small clouds to very large ones, from dev QA to production clouds for running hundreds, if not thousands, of nodes. And it's designed to cope with failure. So hardware will fail. We know that. And what we, what we need to do is basically minimize the effect of that failure on the overall cloud. So I want to talk you through a scenario where we have four servers. Right? We want to put a cloud down on the minimum set of hardware. Maybe it's for dev, uh, proof of concept, playing around. So first of all, we want to put Nova Compute on each of those four machines. Because we want to have the largest capacity available to our users and our customers. And then we also put storage on all of those machines as well. Because if that's Ceph or Swift, it doesn't matter. Um, we want to have the largest amount of capacity for storage as well. And if we have dedicated compute nodes, then we're wasting some storage and we're spending a lot of money on those compute nodes. If we have dedicated storage machines, then again, it's a very expensive machine and we're wasting compute on that hardware. So, in addition to that, beyond just the, the, the storage and the compute, we also need the control services. So let's imagine this is MySQL, right? We need to put MySQL down, so we put it on one of the machines. But actually, we want HA, right? Because if we lose one of those machines, we don't want to stop operations and, and kill the whole cloud. So we put MySQL on three different nodes. Uh, and minimize the risk of losing any one of those nodes. And we do the same with Keystone and Nova Scheduler and all of the other services which, which comprise an OpenStack cloud. But then we put them in containers. Why do we do that? Because we don't want all of these services contending for the same file system. By putting them in, into a container, uh, a Lexi container, much like uh, was discussed earlier, if you were at James's and Tycho's talk. Um, this gives us a secure, uh, isolated little box to run our service in. And these are full machine containers. Um, you can SSH into them, you get a full process tree, you can debug them and inspect their log files, much like you would any other real machine. But we still have the problem that if we were to lose one of these machines, we'd lose one fourth of our uh, one fourth of our cloud. And if we had some important services, the leader, for example, in MySQL running on the same machine as the leader for Gluster, say, if we were to lose one of those machines, the failover that both of those services need to do at the same time could get very messy. So, what happens if we add 
two new servers into the mix. We've grown the capacity of our cloud, so we want to put compute and storage down on, on, this, on this new hardware. But then we can increase the overall resilience of our cloud by moving some of the, some of the services, some of the units, from where they were on the existing set of hardware to the new hardware. So this spreads the load and spreads the, um, the failure across, spreads the risk of failure across the whole set of hardware. So this also comes into our performance story. The best overall performance of your cloud is when every single machine that forms part of that cloud is humming. It's not screaming, trying to keep up with high demand that it can't keep up with because it's blocked on CPU or I.O. or network or whatever. And it shouldn't be just idle, sitting there doing nothing, because then it's an expensive waste of money that you've, uh, you've laid out for this machine, for your hardware, for your cloud that's being underused. So by putting all of the control services across the full set of machines that you have in your cloud, you're, you're making every component of that cloud contribute to the overall, uh, overall throughput and the overall demands on, on the cloud. And it should be simple. We want to make OpenStack available for everybody, and we want to have an easy way of exposing that to, to our end users. And so, that's why we made the autopilot. So I'm now going to switch with a bit of luck and show a demo of the autopilot. So as I said, um, the autopilot is a feature of landscape. Um, it uses both our metal as a service, MAS technology, and Juju, our modeling and orchestration technology to deploy OpenStack. So this is our landing page. We do some checks with Maz to make sure that we've got enough hardware to deploy an OpenStack cloud, and we've met the um, requirements. And then through a simple uh, clicky wizard, we can select our hypervisor, our SDN, and this information has been pre-filled the network information has been pre-filled based on information that's been entered in MAS um, and discovered, hardware information has been discovered by MAS about the particular uh, machines that form, will form part of your cloud. And then we can choose uh, our, both our block and object storage. So I'm going to pick Swift and Ceph. And then we get down to um, the machine view. So here we can see all of the hardware that's been registered in MAS that we can then add to our cloud. We get the um, information about the uh, characteristics of that hardware, how much RAM is available, uh, how much disk is available, how many cores, et cetera. And I can also see that um, they're connected to the, uh, to the network as well. One important part of our architecture is um, harking back to the, the failure, is to record just once in MAS where the common points of failure in our hardware is. So if we've got a couple of racks which share a power feed, or they share a network feed, or they share a cooling system, we can record that in MAS and say all of these machines are in one physical zone. And those zones you define once in MAS when you've wired up the when you wire up the data center, and it's reused throughout the whole stack. So what that means is that your, your failure scenarios, which occur from your physical wiring and your physical setup of your machines, are exposed through availability zones in OpenStack to your users. So that means they can, building, they can build an HA application on top of your cloud which reuses the information that you've already set up once in MAS. So I, I'm going to add another availability zone, which again is a separate physical zone in MAS. So here I can see I've got six machines selected, 
which means I can do an HA cloud. So one important thing, given enough hardware in, given to the autopilot and to the architecture in general, we will deploy HA by default uh, so that you get a production quality cloud. So that is going to kick off um, powering on the machines, install, laying down Ubuntu on them, and then using the charms to pull in uh, packages for the different services which comprise OpenStack. We're not going to wait for this to finish because it takes a little while. Um, but what I will say is, at the end, we, we also want to give you uh, a usable OpenStack. So that means we automatically upload into Glance images for 14.04 LTS and 12.04 LTS, and also set up uh, security groups to allow SSH and uh, ICMP access. And finally, um, set up some uh, information to easily allow Juju to be used to deploy workloads on top of that cloud. And you can see some more about how we facilitate Juju deploying services on OpenStack in a uh, talk later by my colleague, Rick Harding. OK, so now we'll jump to one which I prepared earlier. So this is the dashboard that you see once uh, a region, a cloud, has been deployed. So we get some uh, usability graphs, some trending data to see uh, how our cloud is being used and to anticipate outages and to allow us to do capacity planning and to know when we are running out of block storage or object storage or you know, our machines are screaming and, and really need some more compute capacity. So we also get a, a summary of the existing, uh, the existing hardware, some links to Horizon and to download the RC files. But what I want to show you today in particular is add hardware. So this initial deployment was with six nodes, but there's more machines registered in MAS, which allows me to expand my cloud. And so groups by AZ, I can see here there's region 1.1 and region 1.2. These are two different AZs, again, tied back to that zone information in MAS. So I can see I've got two machines that are already in this zone, which are already in the, in the cloud. But I can add another one. And I can do the same for the second AZ. I can hit it. OK. So again, that is doing exactly the same thing as, as the deployment. It's using Juju and Maz to boot up the machines, install Ubuntu, and then install the software. And automatically, Juju allows us, the, the beauty of Juju is that it will automatically manage the relationships between the different components uh, in, in the cloud so that these compute hosts will automatically show up uh, as additional capacity in, in Horizon or you know, in your um, Nova command line. OK, now I'm going to switch back to, oh, not that one, this one. OK, what about the hardware? So we think it's important to use commodity hardware when building clouds. There's an economic sweet spot, which changes over time as, as new machines come out and new processor technology uh, is released. But at the moment, it's around a, a two-socket, two-U server. So it's important to recognize that the economics of a private cloud are, are very important, and that your users, the users of your public of your cloud, will be competing. They they will have the choice to either use your private cloud or your public cloud. And so, if your OpenStack install isn't using, isn't the the most optimal that it could be in terms of the economics of the hardware that you've bought or um, the services that you and the the headcount that you've got. Uh, allocated to it, then it's going to fail. So commodity hardware, um, as I said, two socket, two U, with approximately 16 gigabyte sticks of RAM in there, seems to be the current uh, 
current sweet spot. OK, so I now want to talk a little bit about the upcoming features of Landscape. So um, the install that I just showed you earlier was, doing, was installing OpenStack Kilo. With the GA release in two weeks' time, we will update that to Liberty. And with 16.04, we will support Mataka. And with that, 16.04 LTS Ubuntu with Mataka, from, from, that on, from then on, we will support live upgrades within Landscape um, to keep your cloud up to date with the new releases of OpenStack as they come out. So N on to O and P, et cetera. OK, one of the new features in Landscape is an additional SDN. So during the beta period, we just had Neutron's uh, ML2 reference uh, plug-in using Open vSwitch. And it, with the GA release, we are adding Open Daylight as an additional SDN choice. And looking forward again to 1604, we will, uh, we will of course, support LexD as a hypervisor on your cloud. So if you, if you were at the uh, talk uh, earlier, just before the coffee break, you would have seen all of the great features um, with LexD and Nova LexD. And that will come with the uh, 1604 release of Landscape and the Autopilot to allow you to get very high density, um, very high density loads on your um, VM loads on your, on your compute. And not pay the virtualization overhead that you get with KVM. OK, um, I've left lots of times for questions. Um, so that's all I want to say today. Thank you very much. OK, so the question was, do you need uh, an internet, uh, internet connection in order to install OpenStack using the autopilot? Um, broadly, yes. There are, um, there are certain sites that we download the images from, for example, and um, uh, download uh, other parts uh, of the charms and the packages to get that. But you can, um, with the GA release, we have uh, proxy support, so you can put it behind a proxy. And, and get all of that information from there. So it doesn't need direct access, but it does require um, access to the internet, yes. So we can download it first, then uh, inside our uh, one. Yes, exactly. So the, the broad steps of installing the autopilot are to first install MAS, which uh, allows you to then uh, register your hardware in your LAN, install MAS onto one of those machines, um, be that a top of rack controller or be that some other um, machine that you've got available. And then um, that allows you, uh, that runs a proxy on it and caches uh, apt packages. And then you install Landscape. And then you would configure a proxy during that installation of Landscape. And then it would uh, use that for going forward. What about Juju storage? Should we also download it? The Juju storage, did you say? Sorry. Juju store storage, I don't know. Report so. Story. Uh, right, so the charms, the, so um, Juju, so during uh, that installation process, uh, you'll bootstrap Juju, uh, install it onto one of the machines on Maz, and then uh, install Landscape. All of that uh, can go through uh, a proxy, but yeah, you need, um, you'll, you will need, there are, there are, there's features in Juju to set that proxy, and that will be reused throughout the, throughout the stack. Um, so you place the services in containers? Right, so um, all of our services are in containers. The only things that aren't are Nova Compute and uh, the Neutron um, Router Gateway uh, service. Every other uh, control service which forms part of uh, the cloud is in, in a uh, Lexi container. Um, so no, we don't use any KVMs as part of the uh, control uh, surface, but obviously uh, KVMs are used for the workloads on the cloud.
Yeah, so I mean, so that's that. I mean, the whole point of of the autopilot is to make it seem simple. Um, the uh, we landscape gets the information from Maz about the uh, hardware and then makes an intelligent choice as to where to put that. So, um, for example, with if you were to install it onto 100 nodes, it puts down three uh, monitors, Ceph Mons, uh, and then OSDs on all of the rest of the hardware, and will use all of the storage available um, beyond the OS disk uh, to expose that as um, uh, block storage, object storage to, to the users, to the workload. So the, if I understand the question, you want to be able to customize the OpenStack that you've deployed using Autopilot? Yes. OK, so. What will happen if we customize it? Then it won't be uh, Autopilot may don't understand what we've done there. Right, so, um, so the question is, uh, after, you've installed, uh, after you've installed a cloud and then you've customized it, uh, could you then confuse the autopilot and it doesn't understand how, uh, how you've done that? Um, you could certainly, um, if you try hard enough, yes, you can break it. Um, it depends what sort of customizations you're doing. Sure, sure. Um, it, it very much depends on what sort of customizations you're doing. Um, uh, the, the overall, the technology that the autopilot uses is Juju to maintain the, uh, to add that hardware and to expand the, the capacity of the cloud. Um, I get, it, it very much depends on what you're doing, but um, the chances are, if it's just you know plugins for um, uh, Horizon or it's uh, changes to uh, configuration files, then um, it depends wh where on the spectrum that is. Uh, some of it will be overwritten, and and would you would be fighting against Autopilot, and some of them it would it would it would just be uh, um, alongside it. So if you if you do want to have a customized version, then all of, the, all of the charms and all of the ways that Landscape is deploying this is open source and is readily available for you to do. So you could, uh, if you don't want the uh, strongly opinionated view that Autopilot has, you can easily reuse the charms, uh, deploy OpenStack, and then uh, customize that. But yeah, you then don't get some of the benefits that you, we have with the, with the system. Any other questions? OK, I have some uh, t-shirts to give out. Um, at, uh, if anybody would like an autopilot t-shirt. And oh, I have a screen lock. <laughs> and I also um, want to remind you, there are um, feedback forms on your chairs uh, or a chair near you. Please fill it in. Um, by doing so, you get the opportunity to win some great Ubuntu swag. Um, so please uh, give some feedback, and thank you very much. Oh, sorry, one more question. Is that part of Landscape? Do you need uh, an active subscription within Landscape? No, so um, with Landscape, with the Autopilot, you can, for free, use up to uh, deploy cloud on up to 10 nodes. Um, that's for free for perpetuity. If you want to expand your cloud or deploy on more than that, then you require some licenses, additional licenses. Okay, thank you very much.